If you've been following along in the lectures, you'll have seen a lot of what we're about to go through before, just used casually. However, there are some subtleties that means it's worthwhile to dig into this just a little bit deeper. As you can see, we're using the same Airbnb data as before, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the very basic task of slicing out columns. So let's try and power through this because you've definitely seen this before. If we want to get, for example, the host name out of the data frame, it's simple. We can pass it in just like this. What we can also do, provided there's no spaces or other nasty symbols in the name, is simply put dot hostname or whatever your column name happens to be. That'll work just as well. If you want to get multiple columns, you've seen that before in the previous video. So we can put in a list in here and get, let's say, hostname and uh, let's see, what's another good one? Neighborhood group. You come down here and you'll get both of those columns straight back out, simple. Now there's another way of doing this, but I'll talk about that after we talk about the next thing, which is filtering on rows. What great, exciting times we're heading into. So let's say we want to take our data frame and only find people that are called Taz as the host. Well, easy. DF, we'll come in here, put the square brackets, df.hostname, host underscore name, is equal to Taz. And this should get us out. It looks like there are far more Taz's than I anticipated, but you can see what's happening here is if we just run this by itself, we're going to get out a Boolean mask. So a list of trues and falses. The data frame that we get out by putting this in the square brackets is going to correspond only to the values where the Boolean mask is true. There are plenty of other things that we can do with this Boolean mask. If I come up here, copy this, paste it down below, and then go dot sum, you'll see that it's telling us that we have six rows that match this Boolean mask, where the host name is Taz. What's actually happening is that sum requests a numeric input, so the true and falses are being converted into ones and zeros. So six true entries means that when you call sum, you get out six. And of course, if we have the mask, there's no reason why you have to do it all in one go. You can write out mask is equal to whatever you want your mask to be, and then just chuck this in the data frame, and let's just grab the first two rows. You'll see that they're what we saw before. The other benefit of pulling this out is that you can combine masks much more easily without having a line that's 10,000 characters long. To do this is simple. Let's come down here. Taz is a bit of a common name. So let's look at, let's say, things that aren't too expensive that you don't need to stay in for a long time. So I'm talking about, we'll come down here and uh, do a mask based on price and minimum nights. So I'll come down here and I'll go quick and cheap as the mask name because that's what this is. And we'll go df.price is less than 100. And then what we'll actually have to do is wrap these in brackets uh, because of the operator precedence. And then go df.minimum nights is let's say less than three. So quick and cheap now tells us that there are 12,000 different properties for less than $100 a night that you don't need to stay at for long at all. So we can just take this mask, throw it into the data frame and have a look at the apartments we get. A cozy entire floor of brownstone. Good on you, Lisa, keeping the prices down. Very proud of her. But I am quite curious if she has good reviews. So we can do a different sort of mask to look at the people that are having good or bad reviews. Let's just throw a little head in here so it takes up less screen space and create a new mask. The reason we're doing this is to show you that you don't have to use the ampersand operator, which is the Boolean and. You can use the Boolean or or other Boolean operators to combine masks in however you want. So for some consistent reviews, we may say, for example, so I sped that code up a little bit, but you can see that we're getting properties that have had at least three reviews per month or a total number of reviews greater than 50. So this should be properties that aren't new to Airbnb or properties that are new, but have a huge number of traffic into them. Now, if for some reason you don't like using these Boolean operators, you can just resort back to NumPy. I come down here and go mask, and then I'm just gonna copy this for posterity, but you can go numpy.logical underscore or, and obviously there's a logical and as well, and all the other logicals, and then just pass in the different masks that you want to combine using the or, you'll see that we get out the same result. So df mask has exactly the same entries, cozy entire floor, cozy entire floor, so that's all done. I would always use the Boolean operators though, they're just so simple and so handy to use, I don't know why you wouldn't. 
Finally, let's say we don't want to look at these places that have good consistent reviews and we want to find the places that don't. Perhaps we want to avoid them. It's super simple to do. I'm going to take this mask down here and all you need to do is put the tilde in front of it. This is the logical inversion. True becomes false, false becomes true. And so now if we do that, you get apartments that don't have consistent reviews. Up until now, we've been filtering rows and columns separately. If you want to filter them together, the method you want to use is lock. For example, if we take this mask up here, which was defined for good consistent reviews, but we only want the name of the apartment, we can come down here and go df.lock, pass in the mask as the first element, and then just request in here, let's say the name of the apartment. So down here, we have all the names satisfying the mask, but we can do more. You can put in, just like you did before when requesting columns, multiple different column names up here. So host underscore name, put that bracket in, and now we have all of these reliable reviews with the apartment name and the host name together. Now with lock, you can use your standard slicing syntax in Python. So if I just want everything here, I can put the colon there just like you would for a general array in Python. I can put mask back and come over here to the column names and put the colon in there. And then you get everything out just as you would if you didn't specify anything and didn't use lock and just went df mask. So as you can see, lock is filtering based on data frame attributes, things like column names and the Boolean masks. If we want something that's closer to how NumPy would work, where you say, hey, I want the eighth index here and you don't really care about the column name, what you want is the method iLock. So I'm going to come down here and throw in a quick bit of markdown as a placement, but uh, copy this code in as well, get rid of the comment, and you can see what this is going to do is df.iloc0 says, hey, this is the zeroth row, so the first row, and I want all the columns. You'll notice that id is the first column, name is the second, which means index zero and one respectively. So to get the first row and name, you would go iloc0, comma, one. And I should be clear here that i is for index, but that means the internal array index, not the pandas index. For example, if I come down here and go df2 equals df set index and just set the id to the index, and then I go df2 dot iloc zero and colon, you can see it's still the first row. The fact that the id in the index now isn't zero doesn't mean anything. It's still just pulling the first row. And as with lock, iLock does respect your standard Python slicing syntax. So you can go, let's say, one to four for the first to fourth rows, or zero index, and you know what I mean, and then six colon for everything after the sixth column and beyond. And you can see that gives us three rows with all of these columns. So your standard slicing syntax works absolutely fine. On top of all of this, Pandas does provide a whole bunch of helpful functions when you're constructing your own masks. For example, rather than having to construct, uh, let's say, price is greater than 100 and price is less than 100, you can combine those together. So let's just go df.lock, and then we'll go df.price. Once you pull out the series, you have between. So if you just go 100 to 200, that will return a mask that's satisfied if the price is between 100 and 200. You can see I'm just going to pull out the price and then just throw a little head on there. And you can see, great, we have five prices that satisfy this criteria. Similarly, if we take this and copy it, I can change this between to is in. Is in accepts a list, so I can change this to, well, you know, let's just keep it to 100, 200, and only units that have a price exactly 100 or 200 will now be shown. Ta-da. And finally, I should point out that masks don't have to just operate on a single column like we have been doing. We can take the whole data frame and just go equals, let's say, some name, John. This will give us a 2D boolean array that will only be true if the host name is John, like it happens to be for our first host. You can see it's complaining a little bit here because I've compared a heterogeneous data frame with different types to just a string, but let's ignore that for now. I feel like you've understood the point. In fact, once you have a 2D boolean matrix like this, or even a 1D one, there are other operations you can do. I showed you some before, but that's sort of a dirty hack. What you can also do is let's say df is equal to John. This is our mask. You can then go any. And if you just call any, it will show you, by default, it does column wise, so it's showing you any column that contains any value of John. So maybe there was a suburb or a neighborhood called John, there isn't. The only column that contains a John is host name. 
But what if we don't care about the columns? What if we want any row that contains John in any way? If it's the host name, or it's in the name, or there's a new neighborhood named John, we want it. It's easy, all you do is you change the axis from the default 0 to 1, and now we have a boolean mask that lets us know if John is anywhere in that row. I really should have named that Waldo. Alright, let's get onto that common pitfall that I alluded to before. It's all about views versus copy, and I hinted at this in one of the first lectures because it would have tripped us up if you remember me setting age to 100 and then going back and saying, does this affect the original data frame? If you come from a lower level coding background, you're probably familiar with this. It's the whole references pointers versus values conundrum, and it's something that does trip up a lot of Python users because they don't have that background to understand exactly what's going on. All right, so I'm gonna come down here and create a new data frame, just a copy of the original one so that we can play with it. Now, let's say just as we did in one of the first lectures, I pull out the name, I get the very first one, and I set it to, let's say, testing. We're testing to see if this works, and I then have a look at the very first row of our new data frame. You can see the name has been updated to testing, and it has given us this nice big warning here to let us know that you might not have wanted this to happen. All right, if you come down here, we're going to try the same thing with lock, and you'll notice it will be different. I'm just gonna go index equals zero to get the first row, pull out the name column, and set that to testing two. Very imaginative. If I pull out the first row again, you can see it's updated, but it hasn't thrown a warning at us, and that's because lock explicitly returns a view. That is, it's not copying the data underneath. Anything you do to lock will affect the original data frame. But see what happens if we break this up into two steps. If I go df2, and let's say I want to get uh, the name. So I go df2.hostName is equal to John, just like we did before. We know that's the first guy. And then I now pull out name, and I set this to something else. Uh, oh no. If we go again, df2.head, you'll see that it hasn't updated the name this time. So what's happening here? And it's quite simple. When we put in the mask in this way, without using lock, we're getting a copy of the data back. So when we then select the name and change it, we're not affecting the original data frame. So this is a subtle difference that is very easy to get swept under the rug. You wouldn't think that, hey, if I use a mask inside lock or outside, I would get different objects out and they would have different properties, but you do. Which is why it's so important to understand what's going on here and to not be afraid of just throwing in a dot copy when you want to make sure that you're not mutating data you don't want to. What I generally do is I use lock almost everywhere and I keep in mind that I am mutating data, but that's normally fine because it's normally what I'm actually trying to do. All right, now it's time to recap this lecture, I believe. So I'm gonna throw in the recap here. And what we covered mostly was using lock and iLock. Those are the two big takeaways, mostly lock. Uh, and remember that lock will allow you to mutate your data. When you're constructing arrays, that is masked Boolean arrays to go into lock or just general masking, there are a whole bunch of helpful functions between is in, any, all, etc. that you can use to create masks that pull out exactly the data that you want. And always keep in mind when you're playing with masks and playing with your data, what's going to come back as a view and what's going to come back as a copy. And if you're not sure and you want a copy, don't be afraid of just throwing a dot copy in there to ensure that you've got that completely explicitly in your code. So let's jump into the next lecture where we're going to be talking about replacing and thresholding data.